From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. One of the biggest issues of our time in the Portland metro area is how to get unhoused people off the streets and into housing and also offer them supportive services so they can eventually transition to permanent housing. Right at the center of that issue is freshman Portland City Commissioner Dan Ryan, who has one of the toughest jobs on the Portland City Council, heading up the Housing Bureau. He's also leading the effort to build six city-sanctioned outdoor shelters called Safe Rest Villages. His office has announced three of those sites. One earlier location had to be nixed because it was in a floodplain. They had hoped to have them all built by the end of this year, but that timeline has been pushed back to sometime next year. The promise of these villages includes compassionate wraparound supportive services, which presents its own challenges, including treating substance abuse, addiction, and mental health issues. Here to give us an update on what's happening with the safe rest villages and how equipped the city, county, and state are to meet those behavioral health challenges, welcome to my guest, Portland City Commissioner Dan Ryan. Also joining us, Mike Marshall, the co-founder and director of the statewide coalition Oregon Recovers. Its mission is to bring world-class prevention, treatment, and recovery services to all Oregonians. And welcome to our guest, Oregon State Representative Tana Sanchez, who represents District 43 in North and Northeast Portland. She is the chair of the House Committee on Behavioral Health. The legislature passed a groundbreaking nearly $500 million behavioral health package in the last session. Welcome to Straight Talk. It's nice to have you all here. Good morning. Good morning. Well, let's begin with Commissioner Ryan to give us the latest update on where we stand with siting and opening some of these safe rest villages. What can you tell us, Commissioner? Yes, I can tell you that, first of all, in June, just nine months into my tenure on city council, we, the entire city council, passed concrete action for houselessness by a 5-0 vote. We then secured funds to make that policy actionable in July, so it wasn't just another unfunded mandate. And then we had the leader hired by August, and she recruited her team, half of which, like me, have lived experience with houselessness by mid-September. So as such, with a team in place, we are making a lot of progress. Uh, we are definitely excited that the three that we have cited are living up to our promise of having geographic diversity throughout the city. And I'm really clear that at this point we'll have um, open safe rest villages in early 2022. I did set an ambitious timeline. I'm kind of built that way, but I wanted to just give some context on the fact that it was really important to get the team in place to move the work. You know, it's really a, a big process. You identify sites, you finalize leases. You engage in the community and you develop, you also try to get the service provider, providers attached. And then there's this thing that everyone's talking about, supply chain. Well, we, we, we're learning about how slow it is to get some of the products in. So we're just dealing with a lot of uh, headwinds that I think anyone trying to build right now in, in our country and definitely in our local market are dealing well, with. Let's jump in and take but a I'm look really, at I'm excited. Let's take a look at where those locations yes. are that you have so far. Uh, the, light, the latest one is the former Jerome F. Sears Army Reserve Center along Southwest Multnomah Boulevard, another lot along Southwest NATO Parkway, and the Menlo Park and Ride at Southeast 122nd and Burnside. And there was word that you might be close to another location. Uh, do you have another one yet, or when will you announce that? I have learned to not um, announce until all the um, attorneys are finalizing their conversations. I will also add that we opened up three emergency sites at the beginning of COVID. They were called C they are called C3PO sites. And our office has been transforming those into a more village environment with actually 24 seven supervision with attractive fences uh, for the people that live there. So we're also transforming those on Water Avenue and in Old Town into uh, a part of the village network as well. I know you'd hope to get the villages open by the end of the year, but as we mentioned, the timeline was pushed back. And one of the reasons for that, you mentioned a few in the opening statement, but it's something called nimbyism, not in my backyard. What specifically are you hearing from neighbors about the villages? None of it's surprising. I think everyone on this panel understands how challenging it is to land government services for the safety net in neighborhoods. I think unless it's a museum or a park, after that, it's pretty difficult to land uh, public services, government services in neighborhoods. So there's a lot of fear of the unknown. 
Um, as we do dialogue with neighbors, we find that people do come along. I know I experienced this in my own, um, when I was leading a charge in Seattle in the early 90s to build an HIV center and the NIMBYism was quite strong. And yet within time, many of those same people who were, let's just say, had a lot of fear and anxiety about it were some of the best advocates, and some of the best volunteers at Bailey Boucher House. So I have optimism that as we continue to build those relationships with neighbors, they will be part of this because they know that it's better than the status quo that they're currently seeing on the streets. What location is getting the most uh, feedback, the most pushback? I would say they all have their different uh, constituents that are showing up. If it's close to a school, there's more of a school uh, lobby concern. Uh, if it's in East Portland, it's why is it always us? So it's it's all, I have a lot of empathy for what the original, what the impetus is to have some of the, the uh, pushback. But I also think that Portlanders in general, we're noticing more and more stepping up to say, you know what, we need to do something. And this is a step in the right direction. And it's better than doing nothing. And it's better to provide services and have 24 seven supervision than the unregulated, um, organic uh, camping that's going on that is the opposite of that. So I think um, in time, more and more are stepping up to say, okay, but we're in. And these villages will have wraparound supportive services. Mike Marshall from Oregon Recovers. How important is that component to the people living there and their chances of successfully transitioning into permanent housing? Um, it's hugely important uh, in the context of uh, you cannot get, you cannot be in treatment if you don't have housing. Um, uh, but once you have housing and once you are have a stable environment, um, a wraparound services are hugely important. Prior to COVID, Multnomah County had one treatment bed per 1,100 people, but Clackamas County had one treatment bed per 12,000, and, uh, or sorry, Washington County had one per 12,000, Clackamas had one per 36,000. So it's a, it's a regional, it's honestly a statewide problem that Portland is, and Multnomah County often is doing the best and the most, but because the surrounding communities are not, it's, it's made that much worse. And so... Um, these wraparound services are hugely important. We went into COVID already being last in access to treatment. It's gotten that much worse during COVID. And so to the extent that um, uh, Dan's uh, uh, efforts are actually putting people in housing, allowing them to stabilize, and then uh, simultaneously giving them access to treatment that um, and wraparound services that otherwise isn't available is hugely, hugely, hugely important and really the best use of the taxpayer dollar. And will you, will Oregon Recovers be interfacing with Safe Rest Villages? Um, so we're a statewide organization, uh, 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 advocacy organization. Because of COVID, we've sort of gotten into the direct service world. So we have Oregon Recovery Org, in which everyone can access both information about services and then be connected to a peer. Um, but many of the partners that support what we do, we're a coalition of many organizations, are part of setting up these new behavioral health resource networks that Measure 110 created. And here in Multnomah County, there will probably be several of them. And they will um, directly engage with these villages. They, they, the, the burns are designed so that there is more aggressive outreach and intervention than the current system even imagines. I want to bring in Oregon State Representative Sanchez, and as we do that, to set the stage for the need for addiction and recovery services that we've been talking about, let's take a look at where Oregon stacks up when it comes to addiction and recovery. These stats are from the Oregon Recovers website, and Mike was telling me that these are pre-COVID numbers, so they're, they're much worse now. Addiction costs Oregon $6.7 billion every year. Oregon ranks 47th in the nation in providing access to addiction treatment. There are six deaths every day, including five Oregonians who die each day due to alcohol and one to two Oregonians who die each day to drug overdose. The consequences of addiction take 17% of the state's funding, while just 1% is spent on treatment and prevention. Oregon has the third highest untreated addiction rate in the country. Representative Sanchez, you and other lawmakers tried to address some of these issues when you passed that groundbreaking package in the last legislative session. It, it makes a monumental investment in behavioral health. How important is that legislation and how do you think it will help in meeting the needs of people who are homeless? Well, Laurel, as you noted, of course, these things, this, that graphic is prior to the pandemic. So it was bad before. 
we had a homeless population before the pandemic and the pandemic has done nothing but exacerbate that situation. We've tried to move legislation in the past to, to really address some of the mental health issues and homelessness issues. And we had some impact, but not significantly. So this package was absolutely necessary to start really pushing those resources in that direction to really recognize that uh, more and more Oregonians became homeless because of the pandemic. Um, and then that in that, I mean, imagine what it would be like to know that you, you had a place to live at one point and then you don't. Imagine what it would be like to wake up, you know, or not maybe not be able to go to sleep because you don't have a place to lay your head that feels safe. Um, that takes a toll on people's mental health. Uh, and then when people are dealing with these uh, issues, they are often doing things like uh, drugs or alcohol to self-medicate those issues. These are huge things that have been happening, not just in this state, but across the country. Again, prior to the pandemic, and again, that pandemic exacerbating these situations. So it is a huge, huge issue. We passed many bills that put significant resources, as you mentioned, into uh, into the system. Some of them designed to really bring more people in to do the work. Some of them designed to sort of readjust our system to look at that crisis response efforts. Uh, you know, we can talk probably much longer about 988 when that comes into play. There are so many different parts of this that we probably don't have enough time to discuss it all right now. Well, Commissioner Ryan, I want to bring you back in too, but you, you talk about 24 seven wraparound services and case managers to work with people living at the safe rest villages. And how tough is that going to be to find enough qualified staff for that? Laura, you're, you're hitting a very important issue that everyone on the panel is aware of, and that is we have a workforce challenge. We don't uh, really incentivize the people that do this work enough. Many of them are on the verge of being houseless and the county and the city is on that. In fact, we increased investments for that just this uh, just this last month with um, some revenue that uh, came from the fall bump monitoring process where both the city and the county were aligned on this point. I also think we have to get uh, creative and innovative both in who is doing the work. We know that people with a lived experience that are in recovery um, offer some of the best skill sets. They might not have an MSW, but they're definitely skilled and ready to be of service. So we can't have enough um, MSWs to fill the, the void. So we're gonna have to get creative on who we hire and, and really provide incentives so that they'll stay. And Representative Sanchez, the package passed by the legislature when I was reading through it, said it included funding to help increase the capacity and diversity of the behavioral health workforce. Is that seeing any results yet? Can you speak to that, to the workforce? Well, unfortunately, it's not quite seeing the results uh, that we would like it to see. It does take a long time to move these uh, these resources through the system. Uh, but I will t tell you that we're also working on other avenues to sort of figure out how do we incentivize the current workforce to stay and not go for higher paying jobs. As you know, as was mentioned, we, we have a workforce challenge. We recognize right now that we're not paying people enough to do these really, really hard, stressful jobs. And those are the people with those MSWs and some of those people without, with you know some of those peer supports people, folks. We are not paying people enough to really live. Uh, you know, our economy is 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 struggling, uh, person to person. We're all struggling to try to get this all figured out. And you know, it, it is just a longer process. It does take time to get these things moving, unfortunately. And we're trying. Well, to complicate things, there's been a nationwide influx of a dangerous version of meth that results in a more extreme high. It's marked by a higher degree of psychosis, and it's made its way to Portland. Mike Marshall, how is meth impacting people in Portland, people living on the street? And are there enough places to take people for treatment? So it's an excellent question. And as the former meth uh, addict on this panel um, it is really alarming to me. And, and prior to the recent headlines about it, um, many of my fellow uh, friends in recovery, we were all struck by the level of garbage was more uh, that uh, now goes hand in hand with the homeless problem is a reflection of use and addiction. Um, so it's it's good that there's some headlines on it, but it's, it's troubling in the sense that um, uh, uh, it's making it much more difficult for people to participate in their own treatment. Uh, the psychosis that goes along with it 
number one, getting people into detox uh, is, is challenging. The sobering center in Portland closed, for example, that was run by Central City Concern for many years because it was set up to help people that were drinking too much and they needed to, it was the old fashioned drunk tank, but better uh, structured. As soon as you start putting people with meth psychosis in there, it just became um, inoperable. And we haven't reopened that or figured out um, a process, a respite center well, that's more than just 24 hours, but arguably based on the science, several weeks may be necessary to get people, once they stop using meth, to be able to participate in their treatment. There's no good dialogue going on in, that I know of to come up with an evidence-based response to that. And it's a reflection, again, to my earlier point, that we don't have a statewide um, coordinated effort and we don't have someone in charge. Governor Brown needs to appoint a recovery czar. The next governor needs to appoint a recovery czar who's going to take all the buckets of money and all the challenges we have to really drive towards a solution that um, uh, takes into consideration the homeless problem, the meth problem, the fa the uh, the workforce problem. There's a lot of people, good people, really people trying to solve, solve each of them, really, and they need to be solved collectively, and um, both in the short term and the long term. And that's a matter of leadership, and the leadership that well, we don't have. Let me bring right Representative now. Sanchez. And what do you think that the state needs to do to meet the need? Do you want to build on what Mike is saying? Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Mike's perspective on this. That's why there were several bills, many different parts of it, because it is a huge system. There's a lot of moving parts to it. We can't, there is no such thing as one size fits all. So it will take a lot of work from a lot of different angles to get to that place where we can actually deal with this issue. You know, I mentioned sort of the, 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 the place of anxiety that we're all in right this very minute. Um, all of these things have just exacerbated a situation that uh, it's going to take us some time to get out of. And again, moving parts that are, that include workforce, that include barriers to education, that include um, systems uh, that we put in place that don't work as well as they should have or could have. And again, more and more like systems we didn't build at all. We didn't build enough of a crisis response to mental health. We didn't build enough addiction treatment beds. We didn't build enough or maintain enough mental health resources. We all know our state hospital is in a, in a crisis mode. We're trying to mitigate all of these different issues, but again, they're all kind of different moving pieces. And so trying to coordinate them all together has been a difficult effort. And I would say that we are making some impact um, while the, you mentioned uh, Hospital 2949, which is a workforce bill, trying to get more people into the field. While that piece is not working, Right this very second, we're still working on the, the mechanics of getting people into the field. We are trying to support people with more resources. Representative you know, temporary Sanchez, increases. I, I need to jump in here because we're running out of time in this segment, but I know, Mike, you wanted to leave people with a place they can go uh, to get more information. Yes, absolutely. If you if you or a family member are looking for reasons, want to talk to a, someone with experience, OregonRecoveryNetwork.org or RecoveryNetwork.org. And um, you can find access to uh, uh, all kinds of treatment, sober housing, uh, uh, a ch chat bot will pop up and ask you if you want to talk to someone uh, that's a certified peer mentor. Well, thank you to our guest, Mike Marshall from Oregon Recovers and Oregon State Representative Tana Sanchez. I wish we had more time. I hope you'll come back and we'll have more with Commissioner Dan Ryan when we come back. We're back in two minutes. Welcome back to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. We're talking with Portland City Commissioner and Head of the Housing Bureau, Dan Ryan. Welcome once again, Commissioner. Always nice to have you here. And I know you've, of course, heard the messages from the nonprofit social welfare organization, People for Portland. And maybe you yourself have received some of the emails from Portland residents through their portal, which say you and other city leaders aren't acting fast enough. You're not doing enough to get people off the streets and into shelter and housing urgently. Here's what co-founder Kevin Looper said here on Straight Talk last month, and then I'll get your reaction. Portland is making it seem like nothing is happening. Just people looking around is uh, is where that problem is. But I would only point out that things aren't happening fast enough and not enough is happening. That's for certain. When they launched the Joint Office of Homelessness between the city and the county, they said they'd be providing 4,500 uh, places a year. Now they're trying to brag about having 2,000. 
Take that to the scale of the problem we actually have on the streets, the humanitarian catastrophe that is happening every night on the streets. Commissioner, why aren't you moving faster? We're, we are a resource like never before. We're taking some really great concrete action. You just saw the alignment between the county and the city when we both had some extra revenue. And instead of uh, doing business as usual, we actually took a pause and worked together to collaborate, to streamline our impact of those investments. That should make people um, pleased. It should have been done a long time ago. And no one's surprised about people for Portland campaign. They're just tuned into the, the discontent that many voters, many uh, residents of the city have. Much of it is pretty captain obvious. You know, they're, they're asking for um, some concrete action on houselessness. We're on it, we're doing safe rest villages, got it. They want police reform with community safety increasing. I've been advocating for that transparency with body ward cameras, got it, on it. And you know, we also are including the community in hiring practices, and we're including the community uh, to help build better relationships between impacted community members of gun violence with police. So it's, it's all fine. I mean, it, it's pretty uh, obvious that there was a voice that needed to be heard and they tuned into it. And I just hope they make a pivot soon. Well, some folks see big vacant properties like a Kmart, for example. Why can't those vacant big box properties be used for places like Safe Rest Villages? What can you tell folks? I can tell folks that those usually have owners many times that don't live in Portland and an attorney in the East Coast looks at that proposition not so kindly. And so, you know, we just are challenged with uh, what looks simple to the average eyeball. Uh, we have to dig in and then find out if it's legally and uh, possible and if it fits into the pro forma of their business plan. So we're, uh, we're hustling the best we can to find those locations and anyone out there that's connected to Peoples for Portland that does have two acres of flat surface that we can quickly build a village on, we're all in. We're here to work with you. Just give us a call. There's a concerning report from the county auditor's office that found the Joint Office of Homeless Services overstated the number of people it's housed in the past two years by more than 20 percent. That's more than a thousand people a year. That doesn't help to give Portlanders a lot of confidence in the work being done. You work with that office. What's your reaction to that news? Yeah, as the person that championed the contract with Built for Zero Community Solutions, a national organization that helps build ready the set data so that we're in real time data as opposed to reflective data or compliance data that HUD wants. So I'm really attached to having data driven solutions because I think you and I have had this conversation before where there's not a one size fits all in terms of who is houseless and what the strategy would be to get them to stability and resilience so they can get on the, so they can work again and, and be a part of society like they would like to be. And so we need those data sets to uh, provide that type of knowledge and, and, and strategic uh, planning. I will say that um, I love audits because they just give you a sense of what's going on and it gives you a work plan on how to move forward. And the, whole, the goal is two years later to see those concerns being lifted. We have just a short time left, but you have a personal connection to this issue with your brother who experienced homelessness and addiction. And today we're taping on Thursday, December 9th, and it happens to be his birthday. Do you want to speak about that? And if he uh, if we'd had safe rest villages when he was alive, do you think it would have would have helped? Yeah, Tim would be 68 today and the timing, you just can't make these things up. So thanks for acknowledging that. Uh, I would say the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, he needed an on-ramp to, to make that desire to be sober more po possible. When you suffer, like Tim did, from dual uh, mental health and behavioral diagnosis, which is quite often a chicken and an egg, um, he became uncomfortable to enter into some traditional, say, uh, congregate shelters, indoor shelters. And the isolation of Tim being in a, a studio apartment, I think, would not have been helpful. But being in a village environment with other people that he could form community with, having access to the behavioral health and mental health uh, people, professionals that are coming into the village um, would have given a lot of hope. And the family would have really been uh, supportive of that. We were definitely in a place where we knew because of our own lived experience that enabling wasn't helpful. And so we were trying to find those um, services and giving them that type of tough love, but it was really hard and difficult to find that type of service. Well, this we, is a picture of Tim with uh, my dad that you said I could put up. And, um, you know, the good news is uh, 
The good news is uh, every day I wake up knowing that this would be helpful to someone like my brother Tim. And we see many people on our streets that are suffering from du dual and triple diagnosis and many are, times. We are thinking of him. I'm sorry, well. we're out of time, Commissioner. There's a day of remembrance on hey, December. Hey, one last 21st. thing. Go Timbers. Let's, uh, we got to win the MSL Cup on That's Saturday. That's right. Thanks for watching Straight Talk today.